Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word again, open our eyes that we too will see Jesus, uh, and that in seeing Jesus, that we will make him the center of our lives, and that he will be the fire in our hearts, as we sung earlier. And so, Lord, I, I just pray, let Jesus be glorified this morning uh, as we hear the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the title of this message is Responding to the Call of the Gospel. Uh, so it's continuation from last week. If you remember last week, uh, we looked at how Peter gave this beautiful sermon. Uh, and, and basically, it's starting from Jesus of Nazareth, the man Jesus, who did all these wonderful miracles. He said, actually, you know, these miracles that you have seen, the healings that you have seen, you have, might have even experienced. He said, this was God working through Jesus. It was God's anointing on Jesus, God's mark of approval on Jesus that Jesus did all those signs. But not only that, God's mission was fulfilled when Jesus died on the cross. You think you killed Jesus, but God was in control. God was fulfilling his plan and purpose. But not only that, you know, God even rose Jesus from the dead. And, and then he goes on to then take some psalms. And he was saying, you know, David in the psalms, he wasn't really talking about himself when he said that the, the person will die and, and, and decay will not take place because we know that um, David died and his tomb can be seen. So it was not David, but he was referring to the Messiah. And then he says, this Jesus is the Messiah. And so he now comes to the point where he makes uh, an invitation, a, a, a call to respond to the gospel. I um, read a book some time ago written by a, a professor, Professor Nicholas Lash, who was a Roman Catholic theologian who lectured, uh, or he's died now, but lectured at the, at the Cambridge University in England. And in his book called Theology on the Way to Emmaus, he says this, the Christian story is latent until someone tells it as her story of the incomparable power of God's transforming grace. That's just the way it happens. Luke makes it clear. Until then, it's just information, common knowledge, rumor, speculation, and possibility. And so what he's saying is this, this two disciples on the road to Emmaus, it was only when their eyes were open and they encountered Jesus through God's transformational grace that their hearts burned within them, they saw Jesus. Before that, they were just talking about the information. They were talking about what had happened about this Jesus. But when they encountered Jesus, their life was transformed. And, and so... We, we want to think about this um, power of God's grace. And that's the passage where their eyes were open, their hearts were burning within them when they encountered Jesus. Their, 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 their hope was renewed. They went and rushed back and told the disciples this amazing thing that has taken place, um, that Jesus uh, is still alive. He is risen. And our hearts burned within us when we encountered this Jesus. The same thing happened in the other reading as well that we saw in Acts, uh, where the people, uh, G G Peter makes this amazing statement, therefore let all of Israel be assured of this, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And when the people heard this, they were cut to their hearts and, and said to Peter um, and the other disciples, Brothers, what shall we do? Uh, I find it um, hilarious that they would call the disciples brothers because if you remember the story in Acts 2, they, first, of them, first of all, when they encountered the disciples, they called them drunks. <laughs> these were people drunk in the early morning, 9 o'clock, and these people appeared to, to, to have been drinking, and, and all of a sudden, they suddenly turned away from, from calling the disciples drunk to calling them brothers. Um, the, the other thing would be, I, I'm, I'm not surprised that they were cut to their hearts, because um, all the while, Israel had been waiting for this Messiah, for hundreds of years, the, the, the prophets talked about this coming Messiah, and suddenly they were told that they had killed the Messiah. I mean, how would you feel <laughs> when you come to encounter that, you know? Uh, no, 
excuse me, no wonder they were cut to their hearts because all of a sudden they said, what, what are we going to do? Um, but also there was the work of the Holy Spirit in this whole situation that when they heard the story about Jesus, this Messiah, who came to die for their sins, they were struck. They were, it's, it's like, you know, we, can, we use this, the, 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 the word bomb, uh, bomb struck, you know, uh, or shell shock, that's the word I wanted, shell shocked, you know. Uh, it's like, you know, like a bomb has exploded and all of a sudden, everybody there was shell shocked. What are we going to do? And Peter goes on to explain uh, what they should do. Uh, Peter's response is, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. That's the response uh, Peter gave. So let's look at it. Let's unpack this a little bit. So he first said, you got to repent. And, and uh, he says, repent and be baptized. So repent. What do we mean by repent? We often think about repent. We think about, oh, you know, asking God I'm so, that I'm sorry for all the things that I've done wrong, all the sins that I've done wrong, that I've messed up my life. God, forgive me. That's, that's what we normally think about repent, isn't it? But the Greek word here for repent um, is metanoia. So meta, and, and we, we, we have that in English as well, metamorphosis. Uh, meta is change or to alter, to, 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 to make a change. Uh, and and, and um, noia, metanoia, comes from the word gnosis, knowledge. Noia is thought, the thought pattern. And so what Peter is saying, the first thing you've got to do is change your thinking. So what did he mean by that? You see, when the people standing and listening to Peter's sermon, they had a different view of Jesus. They saw Jesus as a mere mortal, a human being. They saw Jesus as maybe a good rabbi, a good teacher, a good man, did good works. They may have even seen Jesus as a criminal, someone who got nailed on the cross because he did something wrong in their minds. And so they all have these different views of Jesus. And Jesus is saying to them, the first thing you got to know to do is change your thinking about who Jesus is. And I, if you remember Jesus with his disciples, there was another time he asked people, you know, the disciples especially, who do you say that I am? You know, what, what, who do people say that I am? And say, oh, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you are Elijah. And then he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And so at that point, Peter had a metanoia. Peter, if you like, repented, <laughs> changed his thinking. Instead of seeing Jesus as a rabbi, a good teacher, he saw Jesus for who he really is. And so Peter was standing there now and saying, if you want to know what to do, you've got to change the way you see Jesus. Because the way you see Jesus will then determine how you live your life, right? And if you see Jesus as a good teacher with good teachings, yeah, okay, I will listen to some of his teachings, I might follow some of his teachings. Or if Jesus is a great healer, well, yeah, maybe I'll come to him for healing. But if this Jesus is both Lord and Messiah, if that is true, then you've got to change the way you see Jesus. And it's the same for all of us. You, you talk to people in the world. How do they see Jesus? And they can give you 101 ways they see Jesus. Some of them see Jesus as a swear word. Some of people see Jesus as a figment of, of our imagination. Some of us might say Jesus is, is a man who lived in, in some point in history, like Alexander the Great and other people. And all these people in the world, if they want to know what they need to do to be a Christian, the first thing they need to do is change their thinking about who Jesus is. Because if you still have 
the thinking of Jesus that is not biblical, then you would actually live a different life. Um, I grew up in a Christian home, and I went to church as a, ch as a kid, as a child. I've, I have no doubt that Jesus was God. It was sort of ingrained in me. I, I never questioned that. But for me, Jesus was someone far off and aloof and, and, and actually not interested in my daily life. And so, so I would go to church on Sunday, even though I, wasn't, I wouldn't regard myself as a Christian. Uh, as a kid, I would go to church on Sunday, but Monday to Saturday, uh, I live a totally different life. Uh, I was quite a, a rebellious kid. I, 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 I did all sorts of things that I shouldn't have done. My knowledge of Jesus was, didn't actually affect my Monday to Saturday life. Uh, he was God, yeah, you know, but he was somewhere far off. It was only when I encountered Jesus, and, and, and in a sense, my heart burned within me uh, in knowing Jesus, it changed my life. It's, it made me realize that it's not just coming to church on Sunday, it's that this, this knowing Jesus has to, to govern the way I live from Monday to Sunday, 24-7. That if Jesus is truly Lord and Messiah, then then I need to then submit to his lordship. Every area of my life must come under his lordship. If, if, if not, then I don't really believe that Jesus is Lord. If it's truly, genuinely something that we hold on to and, and, and say Jesus is Lord and, and the Messiah, the anointed one, then it, it must change our lives. Because if it doesn't, there, there is something wrong, isn't it? We need to change our thinking. We need to change our thinking of who Jesus really is because that will govern our life. And, and Lisa mentioned something about, you know, in, in her testimony, and she talked about, you know, trusting God. We often trust God for what we have and say, what we have, that's great. But can we trust God when we haven't received? <laughs> you know, can we trust God when we are not seeing the reality walking by faith, not by sight. In our understanding and knowledge of Jesus, do we really believe that he is faithful and will never ever let us down? Can I trust this Jesus in my thinking so that I would trust him for everything that happens in my life? My relationships, my finances, everything. If Jesus is someone who will never ever leave me nor forsake me, have I changed my thinking and, 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 and that has then changed the way I live because that's who Jesus is. So who is that Jesus in your mind? Are we able to change our thinking to a way that, that we live our lives based on the thinking? So in other words, how are you living your lives right now? If I were to look at your life, does it show me your thoughts and views of Jesus? If I were to look at your bank account, <laughs> which I won't, uh, does it show me who are you trusting? What is, the, what, is, what is your passion? Are you spending more money on the golf club <laughs> or you know, in, 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 in the work of God? And, and so, what is your thinking about who this Jesus is? I like the words of Paul in, in Colossians, because Paul began to know Jesus for who he really is. And he says in, in Colossians 1, this Jesus, he's the son, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in him... All things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is, the, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church, the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This is the, the, the Jesus that Paul has changed his thinking to believe in. So what is the Jesus 
you are believing in or who is the Jesus you are believing in? Is he someone that you can totally trust to know that he will not let you down? And that's, that's the repentance that Paul was saying here. To, to, to repent and to believe in, in this Jesus who, who is both Messiah and, and, and God. And, and, and that is what he was calling the, 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 the crowds to, 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 to believe, to change their thinking. This is who Jesus is, both Lord and Messiah. And then the next thing he goes on to say, to be baptized. Now, this, this verse has probably divided the church over the centuries when it comes to salvation. You know, is baptism part of salvation? You know, you know repent and be baptized, and then you have the forgiveness of sins, you know. Uh, and, and so you have denominations that, that believe you've got to be baptized to be saved. So it's not just repentance, not just faith, but baptism as well. Uh, and then for us as Anglicans, we see it as a covenant uh, that, that, that God pours over families. And, and then you have the Baptist view that, that you know, you've got to, to actually believe in Jesus Christ for yourself and then, and then, and then get baptized. You know? So we have all these different theologies, different doctrines that has divided the church. And, and I don't think Peter here was actually talking about salvation. Um, he, he was actually, I believe, talking about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Because that's, that's what he, he knows. And in a sense, salvation is not just an event that happened. It's also a process. Because the Bible talks about, yes, we were saved, but we are also being saved. But it's also a destination that we will be saved. And so for Peter, he would be thinking about his call. Come follow me. And, and so for him, it was giving up everything to follow Jesus Christ. And that process that he had to go through from Jesus being a rabbi to Jesus being Christ, the son of a living God, was a growing process. So the changing of Peter's thinking was a process. It wasn't something that happened straight away. And so when Peter says to repent, he, he was, I believe, thinking of a process that, that over time your thinking about who Jesus is must change. Because as your thinking changes, so does your life change. And then he says about being baptized as part of the baptism process. And yes, he was thinking of this water baptism. But I think he was not just thinking about that symbolic act of what baptism means, but rather it is the, the meaning of baptism. And, and to understand the meaning of baptism, we, we go to Romans, where, where Paul identifies baptism as, as dying with Christ and rising again with Christ. And so baptism is about death and resurrection. So we are dying to our old way of living. So as our thinking of Jesus changes, our old way of living is dying. That we stop living the way we used to live, and as our thinking changes, we then also rise again to be resurrected with Christ. Uh, or as he says in Galatians, it's about being baptized into Christ Jesus. That, that when we change our thinking of, of who Jesus is, we, we, we recognize and we realize that we are now one with Christ. That, that our baptism is, is identifying with who Jesus Christ is. And so repent, change our thinking about who Jesus Christ is, and baptism to realize that you have died to your old way of living and you are taking on a new way of life, which is a Christ-centered life, where Christ is your center, as we sung earlier. And that is what he was calling his disciples, uh, the crowd to do, that, that it's not just about being saved and then going back to your everyday life and living like how you have always lived, what he's saying is that you've got to recognize that, that, that change your thinking of who Jesus is, and then to know that you are dying to your old way of living and rising again to a new way of living. So that's the second thing he mentions. But there is a third, uh, and, and so in Galatians 2.20, 
uh, which is what he's saying. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself. So it becomes a life of faith in Jesus Christ. And the third thing he says, and often that's sort of missed out in that passage, uh, is that, that he calls the people to be part of the community of faith. And, and um, Peter gave quite a long message, a sermon that day, but what Luke, the writer of Acts says, Peter says so much other stuff as well, um, but it's not, he didn't write it down, but what he, he wrote down basically is this, that Jesus was making a plea, save yourself from this corrupt generation. And so that's the third thing uh, Peter was saying to the, to, the, to the hearers, not just to repent, change your thinking about Jesus, not to recognize that you are dying to your old way of living and, and rising up to a life of faith, but also that you got to save yourself from this corrupt generation. What does that mean? If you were to go through scripture from, Je from the Old Testament right up to the New Testament, whenever it talks about a corrupt generation or evil generation, or Jesus will say this generation, it's referring to the evil world that we live in. That the evil world out there, society itself is corrupt, is evil. And as people of God, as, as you, you, you change your thinking about Jesus, as you die to yourself and, and live a rise up to a new life, you need to break away from the society you are in. And so we are called out of that evil generation to be a new creation, to be a new community. And instead of embracing the philosophies and practices of a corrupt generation, we need to keep ourselves separate from the corrupt generation. And in, in a sense, Peter is saying here, he was calling them to come and be part of this new community called the church. And he was inviting them to come and join them, join the band of, of, of brothers, join the, the band of brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and 3,000 people responded and was added to their number. And so the call of Peter was to change your thinking Recognize you are dying to your old life and living a new life of faith totally in Christ and to actually come out of this evil generation, evil world and be a separate people. Yes, we are called back into the world, but we are not of the world. And then finally, what do we receive? Um, and, and this is, I'm going to end here, but what Peter is saying here in some ways, he is quoting the Old Testament. Uh, in this new covenant in Ezekiel, two things that God promises in Ezekiel, that he would forget, wash them from all their sins, that, that he'd be, they'd be washed and cleansed from their sins, and he will give them his Holy Spirit. And so here is Peter saying, this is the new covenant, that, that we, we are now rescued from a life of sin. We have changed our thinking of Jesus, we are now experiencing God's new covenant, and because of that, there is forgiveness of sins, and, and that forgiveness of sins, the word that is used here in the New Testament is a, a word that, that talks about is freedom. It's freedom. So, so the Greek word is freedom, to be free from things that, that hold us back, things that bind us, things that, that causes us to feel guilty and condemned, that when we are forgiven of the sins, is the breaking of the chains, that you are free. And that's what Galatians 5 talks about. It's a freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm then and do not let yourself be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. So the forgiveness of sins is, is freedom in Christ. And then he talks about the Holy Spirit and you will receive. Part of the covenant that he gives you the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, in order that you can live a life that God wants you to live. And then later on, in, or actually in Acts 1.8, we read about how the Holy Spirit came upon the church. So the challenge here this morning is this. How can we be the church Peter calls us to be? Firstly, to change our thinking of who Jesus is. Do we see Jesus as Lord and Messiah? And if he is Lord, 
How much of your life is he lord over? Is he lord of all or just part of your life? And secondly, have you moved away from your old way of living to embrace this new life of faith, where we walk by faith, not by sight? And then thirdly, have we come out of the evil practices of the world we live in to embrace the practices of Christ? And then going back into the world to be salt and light of Christ's righteousness in this world that needs to see his righteousness. And God does that by setting us free from things that hold us back and giving us the Holy Spirit to enable us to live a holy life, but also to be his witnesses. Let's pray. Let's just close our eyes for a few moments. And, and maybe there are things in this message that you were challenged, the Holy Spirit has been prompting. And, and maybe you feel right now that your thinking of Jesus has not caused you to live a life that is pleasing of God. And maybe the Holy Spirit is saying to you this morning, you need to change how you see Jesus. Is he truly the Lord of your life? Is he truly your Messiah? If so, Jesus says, then seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, and, and everything else will fall into place. Is Christ the Lord of our life to a point where we are seeking first his kingdom? And maybe this morning, God is calling you to change your thinking, to see Jesus as the king of kings, and he's coming to herald in his kingdom. Maybe you haven't died your old way of living. You're still sort of trying to live both kinds of lives. And God is saying that lukewarmness has no place in, in God's kingdom in a sense that he wants us to be either totally for him or not for him. And maybe this morning the Lord is challenging you to let go of your old way and make today a day that you live for Christ. And maybe the challenge this morning is that you haven't really embraced the community of faith, that you come to church but not feeling a part of the community. And that's what it means to be a community of faith where we can encourage one another. It's like what the, the writer to the Hebrews is, is, is said um, um, in Hebrews chapter 10, where he says to... To, to spur one another towards love and good deeds, not giving up the meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. Maybe it's encouraging you this morning to make a decision to, to be part of the church, to be active part of the church, to, 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 encourage, to, to one, encourage one another, to keep one another pressing on to follow Christ. Maybe that's what God is calling you to do today.